Hi everyone, nice to see you again if you've been here before and nice to meet you if you're new. I wanted to talk about why I love reading nonfiction books as well as give a few recommendations of the books that I've read so far in my life that I actually own to recommend. <laughs> so, uh, how do I begin? Um, I've said this so many times, but I don't generally read a lot of fiction books. I don't even have that many fiction books on my shelf, to be quite honest. Um, my fiction section on my bookshelf is actually quite small. And I've read most of those books, but it's been years since I've read them. And some of them I haven't read. But the point is, is that I don't read fiction books that often. And it's not necessarily because I have a vendetta against fiction books or anything like that. So please, please don't take that as anything that I'm saying. Um, it's just that I haven't really been in the mood to read fiction lately. Um, for the past few years, in fact. I, I have read fiction in the past. I have enjoyed fiction in the past. There's certainly fiction out there that I've enjoyed, but it's just not my cup of tea right now. But I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. This is about nonfiction books. <laughs> so why do I love reading nonfiction books? And I'm going to try and describe this the best way I can, but mostly I know that I know when people read fiction books, they kind of read fiction books to kind of disconnect from reality, to kind of go into their own world, to get away from all their worldly woes and I'm not trying to make fun of it. No, that's a completely valid thing to want to read for. Wanting to read to disconnect a bit from the harsh realities of life is completely valid. And I used to do that too. I mean, when I was young and read a lot of fiction books, I often read like romances, for, like teen cheesy romances. And it was like, at the time, I thought that I'd never be in a relationship. So it was nice to be in those situations where I got my heart beating fast and it felt like, it felt like this is a world I could be in, but it wasn't the world that I am at. I don't care about that as much anymore, <laughs> but that, but that's how I was when I was a kid. That's, that's how I was. So why am I not like that now? Why why do I read nonfiction books? I do something in the exact opposite of disconnecting. I want to connect to this world. I feel like nonfiction books really help me connect to reality in a way that fiction books can't for me and I know a lot of people like being disconnected from reality because the world is just so shit sometimes there's so many things happening in politics there's so many things happening in the weather that's making things worse and worse and worse and there's so many things in the world to be angry and frustrated and sad about and I do happen to pick up a lot of books about those types of subjects. And I wouldn't say that I get joy out of reading them, but I do feel more connected to this world when I understand it a little bit better. When I understand the systems that are in place that we live under and understanding them to the point where maybe I can do something about it. Maybe I can spread people's voices. Maybe I can do something about it. Now, I can only do so much, but reading helps me feel like if I know this stuff, maybe I can do stuff with this knowledge to help make things better. 
and that's one reason, but I also read nonfiction books that aren't necessarily as, you know, deep and dark, you know? I do read a lot of nonfiction books that have to deal with a lot of social issues that are a bit dark and sad, but I also read nonfiction books that are nice and happy. You know, people think that the only type of nonfiction book is something that's more textbook-like or something that's sad and dark and not something they want to learn about. But I just don't, I, I just believe that if you're looking for nonfiction books, you should really look into the various corners we have because Honestly, there are so many nonfiction books out there, and I've only scratched the surface of what I love to read. And I, I don't know. I guess it is. I don't like being disconnected from reality. I like being settled in the world that we're living in and try to do better by it and you know I can't solve all my problems and all the world's problems with books but knowing where we're at and how the world works may help me figure out how to not solve problems but make things better you know and that's the reason I read so many books about social issues because of that and I also read books that are a bit dark like about the cult stuff I I mean those are their own behemoth if you want to talk about them and maybe it is partially a deep fascination a dark fascination with it but it is also like helps me empathize with people like really sit there and be like wow this situation i'm not going through this and i'm an outsider but it makes me feel better for them whenever they get out of those situations it makes me figure out it makes me feel a little bit of hope that maybe things could change so it's not that i like learning about sad things and things that make me angry and want to punch things sometimes but knowing what I'm dealing with and what the world is like is important to me I mean when I originally started going back to school after a three-year break between high school and college I decided to go back for sociology and I took a lot of psychology and soci sociology classes as many as my community college had <laughs> and I don't know I just don't know how to describe it I I feel like people might think I have this like dark curiosity and maybe part of it is that. I won't deny that there isn't a part of it that's like that. But I also think it's just me wanting to understand the world we're living in. And that's why I read the books that I do. Um, but if you are looking for books that are non-fiction, that aren't about so, so sad of subjects, <laughs> I highly recommend checking out um, Olive's channel, A Book Olive. I will link her channel in the description. She writes a lot of books about nature and TV shows, and she does, and she reads a lot of books about nature. I think you guys would really like her videos. She recommends a lot of great books, and I've put a few on my TBR, but I have not gotten, gotten to them yet. But she reads a lot of books like that and I think that if you're looking for books that maybe are a little bit more lighthearted, definitely check out her channel and she reads a lot of science books, she reads a lot of nature books, she 
she has themed the books sometimes. She'll do books about two different books about the same subject. Like I think she did, I think she did like ones about bees and another one about apples and she does talk about fiction books too so she's not like me that doesn't read any <laughs> fiction books like barely at all um but she does talk about fiction books too so definitely check out her channel i will link her down below i am going to suggest a few books that i have read over the past few years some of which i just read this year and i have enjoyed immensely and uh, let's just get into them why don't we so these are the books that i've read this year and that read this year in the past few years like some of them are not new i mean i don't think any of them are brand new maybe one or two of them i'm not sure no i don't think any of them are brand new i think some of them have been out for a while I'll have to check the dates <laughs> but I'm pretty sure most of them are not brand new uh, yeah I don't think any of these books over here are new <laughs> but the point isn't the newness the point is that I love them and enjoyed them and yeah <laughs> so here are the books that I'm going to suggest to you. Some of them have to do with social issues and some of them are a bit more lighthearted than others. So the first one uh, I just read this past month. Um, I read it in May of 2023, in case you're watching this at a different time period. Um, and I have enjoy I enjoyed it very much. I listened to the audiobook and I liked it so much that I bought the physical because I just enjoyed it so much and I wanted to be able to reference it anytime I like. So this is How Minds Change the Surprising Science of Belief, Opinion, and Persuasion by David McRaney. This is what it looks like. And let's read a little bit. Uh, when acclaimed science journalist David McRaney had the opportunity to interview a prominent flat earther in front of a live audience, he jumped at it. In his popular podcasts and lectures, McRaney had spent years studying self-delusion and decision-making and had practiced persuasion techniques with leading researchers. It was a moment of truth in a world that seems more polarized than ever. ever. Can minds change? I thought I'd read a little bit of it, like, because I know I'm not very good at describing books. <laughs> I'm still, still trying my best. <laughs> I'll get better as time goes on. I think I've gotten a little bit better. <laughs> the reason I like this book so much is because it did talk about more severe cases of people who have very severe beliefs that are harmful who have gone through the process of changing their minds and their beliefs about things. And he spends an entire chapter talking about the Westboro Baptist Church and people who left it. And he's, the most of the other chapters are about his talking to researchers about what their methods are to really change people's minds like change people's perspectives on things and he went on a search to find different ways and methods that people are able to change people's minds or at least at the very least getting them to think about why they believe certain things and that's what i loved the most about this book was the fact that it doesn't always say that you're going to change someone's mind it Changing these processes that he talks about this book are long processes. They're not something that you can just do in a second, you know? And I think people have this tendency when they're trying to change people's minds, and I do it too, that they get on the defensive and 
pull up all these articles and books and news stories and all this stuff that we have that supports our beliefs. And we go through it with them. We talk about this, 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 and this. And we hit all the points that we want to hit. I'm not as good as doing that. But we hit all the points we want to hit. And they still don't listen, you know? And I don't necessarily think debate is necessarily about changing people's minds. I think it's about making, changing your audience, your audience's minds. However, uh, this talks about more specifically about changing people, specific people's minds. And I just, I don't know what it was, but I really enjoyed the book. I have so much trouble in my own life trying to get people to see things in a different light. Mostly because I get angry and frustrated. So I was kind of searching. I was on the search for, and I, I read a different book about baits that kind of like was a completely different book than this. But we're talking about this book. <laughs> Sidetracks, distracts. <laughs> And this book just stuck with me because it was all about a compassionate way to look at the idea of changing people's beliefs. And the biggest thing that he really tackles in the book is this idea of making people think about why they believe certain things. Because I think that, I think, and he makes it pretty clear in the book, that it's pretty, we don't tend to necessarily, not, how do I say this? Not everyone is so secure in their beliefs that they know exactly why they believe it. Sure, there are people on both sides of the spectrum that know why they think something and everything. But those people who are not sure why they believe something, are just believing it because they're following the crowd. They have a moment to think. Why do I think that? Why do I believe in that? And it's all about getting people to that place. And it takes a lot of work. It's... It's not a it's not a simple process. The none of the processes in this book are simple. So yeah. I highly recommend this book. This is again what it looks like. I like the cover. I think this is a pretty neat cover. <laughs> I nonfiction books, I will admit, never have really unique covers. <laughs> not like fiction books. But you know, I'll get what I can take. <laughs> But anyhow, this book is great and if you're looking for a new method and I will warn people that I think this book is better in like ally hands, not in necessarily marginalized groups. Um, if you are marginalized in any way, it may be hard to address things with compassion the way that this book does. It's a lot of emotional labor and I don't think it'll work for everyone. I don't necessarily think you should not have sources ready and not be able to tell your side of the story, but this takes a lot of effort and compassion and kindness to really get these systems across and it's something I personally want to work into my life and that's why I bought the book because I want to be able to read it whenever I want to reference it whenever I need it so that is that book um like I said I read that last month and I absolutely adored it this one I also read this year and it was the first book I read in 2023 and I've already talked about it in a video, one of my stats videos, and I'm pretty excited to talk about it. That is Semicolon 
the past, present, and future of a misunderstood mark. There's something on the book. There was a little piece of something on the book. Um, it's by Cecilia Watson. I absolutely adored this book. Now, I heard about this book from Answer in Progress channel, um, from Sabrina, and she talks about this book. She specifically does a video about semicolons. And I love learning about language um, and linguistics, uh, especially English linguistics, because generally that's the language I know, so. But I love learning about linguistics and I wanted to, grammar, I have a love-hate relationship with grammar and this book really goes into depth about where grammar started um, and certain laws that were taken into scrutiny because of a semicolon and punctuation marks. Um, just the history of the semicolon and grammar itself in this book is just, it was such a good book. This is one of those ones that I think are a little bit more lighthearted and highly recommended it if you're a bit of a language nerd, especially, Especially if you're a grammar lord, because I don't like calling people Nazis whenever they they just are obsessed with grammar for some reason. I don't necessarily think they're Nazi is a loaded word. Let's not use it to describe people who are obsessed with grammar. Um, but I'll call them grammar lords. People who are grammar lords need to read this <laughs> because and they also need to read oh wait i just remembered another book that i'm gonna add to this one as a bit of a um of a combination of the two this one is specifically about grammar and semicolons this one is also about grammar and it's called what's your pronoun beyond he and she by dennis Barron. And this is also a language book, and it's specifically about pronouns. And both of these books get into grammar themselves, itself. And I loved, absolutely loved both of these. I both, uh, both of these I read this year, and I absolutely love them. I kind of want to reread them already because I'm working on a vlog, finally, about language books. And I want to reread these, or at least semicolon um but yeah these let me just hold one up at a time this one is was is already one of my favorites it's my new favorite book um not all-time favorite but it is one of my top favorite books now and i absolutely loved reading it and i think that it will be a trip for anyone who's bit of a grammar stickler and that goes for this one as well. This one talks about they, them pronouns and the history of pronouns and throughout, throughout history, I, I, that was a bit redundant to say, but the history of pronouns and all the, everything that went on with pronouns. This also talks about um, politics and how different pronouns were used in politics to like control people and repress people's rights specifically women's rights and yeah i just both of these both of these were great books i highly recommend them and i can't believe i forgot about this one i am so mad that i didn't think about it before but i'm showing it to you now so pick up both of these books if you're looking for grammar books that kind of uh, take you out of your comfort zone when it comes to grammar. These next two I'm going to talk about in tandem 
in together whatever the word is I don't think in tandem was the phrase that I'm looking for but it might have been I'm gonna talk about these two together because they are both my absolutely favorite books ever uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is my number one favorite book <laughs> and that is the library book by Susan Orlean this is what it looks like I love this book my mom got it for me it has this pretty spine and it has the um I don't know what those are called deckled edges or something like that you know the imperfect edges I just <laughs> this is my favorite book and honestly this is part of the reason I love working in libraries this book sparked that love of libraries for me it wasn't the only thing that sparked it but it was one of the things that sparked library work for me and it talks about the Los Angeles Public Library that burned down in 1986 um, it didn't burn the whole building down but it did cause significant damage to the inside of the building and to a lot of material within the building and it talks about not only the day of that happening but it also touches on the history of the library um, who used to run the libraries the librarians the fights for different rights for being a librarian with women and talks about um, the history of libraries in general like she has a whole bit in there about the library of Alexandria um, and how it's a bit of a myth to be quite honest and she just talks about the trial that happened with the library of uh, the library against the person they think burned the library down and it just goes back and forth there's there's pictures inside if you if you decide to read this, get the physical copy because there's pictures inside. But I did first read it with an audiobook and then I found out it had pictures and I'm like, oh, I need to get the book. So I did. Look, it even has in the it even has a picture of the library in the front of the cover. Also, if you get I don't know if it's like this in the hardcover, but and this almost said soft back. Jess Owens husband says soft back sorry this is in the back <laughs> it's such a cute little detail oh I love this book so much I just love it so much and don't tell my family but I'm gonna get the cover tattooed on my hand just love it so much and like I know you're probably thinking that's not even a cool cover you know that's just a lame cover but it means so much to me. I want it, I want it permanently on my body because it, I love this book just so much. And I was thinking of getting like the cover done and then around the cover put these like little palm tree things around the cover and those little birds um, kind of like as a design around the cover. I have so many ideas. Um, but this is one of the books that I'm thinking about getting tattooed on my hand. It's, it's, it's my ultimate favorite book. It is just a great book. And I love it so much. And you should definitely check it out because it it is, it is, for lack of a better word, it is an ode to libraries. And I think it's very much worth the read. And it's not too heavy of a read it's actually you know it talks about heavy topics but it also shows the love for libraries and how people love libraries and the love that people put into libraries and so it's definitely if you love libraries if you love books pick it up it's amazing the next one is my second all-time favorite book, and that is Word by Word, The Secret Life of Dictionaries by Corey Stamper. I also like this cover. I'm not going to get this tattooed on my hand because look at all that detail. That, no. <laughs> I've never gotten a tattoo before, and I'm already still scared of it, but no. <laughs> but I do love this book. It is about a lexicographer 
Corey Stamper works for the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and she talks about her many experiences working for the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. She talks about how how she got into it. Um, she talks about her love for language and how much of a word nerd she is. And she just talks about the different experiences that she had over the years of working at Merriam-Webster. One of the things that she touches on, and this is just one of the things, there's many things she touches on, but one of the things she touches on is the the definition of marriage changed in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. This was before, I believe this was before um, uh, same-sex marriage was legalized. And I, marriage, I'm pretty sure this was, this happened before marriage equality was legalized is the term I was looking for. And they had changed recently. I think they had changed the definition of marriage to include gay marriages. And she dealt with a lot of people emailing Miriam Webster being angry about the fact that they changed the definition to be more inclusive of queer people. And she talks about this whole experience and it was, it was a bit, it was, it was like this whole, it was intense, but I mean, not like super intense, it's still like a lighthearted book, but it was, it was interesting, you know? And she, she talks about, I, I'm in the middle of rereading it. <laughs> I actually stopped a really long time ago and haven't restart, so I'm going to start from the beginning again. But <laughs> I absolutely love this book. I, if you couldn't tell, I'm a bit of a word nerd myself. I love language. I love learning about language. Um, if it wasn't obvious by the last few books that I've talked about. So I loved this book. It was such a fun time and I just, uh, I loved it so much. I loved it so much. And I can't state how much fun this book was. You know, it did talk about some pretty, like sometimes a little heavy things sometimes. Um, obviously like that, like marriage, the definition of marriage and but it was, she did it in a lighthearted, almost funny manner sometimes. So it was, I just love this book. Um, and I wanted to, I was going to save those for last, but I didn't exactly put this in any specific order. So they just happened to be together. <laughs> but this next book does not have a cover. Um, I got it off of thrift books, so I kind of just have to show you the sign side, and that is Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Wait. There we go. And like I said, don't have a cover for it. I don't even know what the cover looks like. <laughs> Cause when I first read this, I read it as an audiobook. But I loved it so much that Oh, there's, I just, I've never actually cracked open this book before. I just realized there's notes in here. Or at least there's a lot of highlighting. Ooh, that's fun. You know, I personally don't take notes in my books, but I do like getting books from people who annotated their works because I love seeing what they have to say about the books that they're reading. So I don't personally annotate my books, but I love reading annotated copies of books. <laughs> I think it's so fun. Back to what I was saying. Weapons of Math Destruction. This book um, left a lasting impression on me. It's been a few years since I read it. I was gonna read it one year. I was gonna reread it for Nonfiction November, but I never ended up getting to it because I'm terrible at reading books. Oh. <laughs> but, This is pretty much about math and how it kind of affects reality and how there can be consequences. So like machines and math in general and 
the way that it works and can and statistics and all that kind of stuff it's it's been a few years it's been a few years i feel bad recommending it despite my despite it not being fresh in my mind you know but i remember it lasting it, it having an impact on me whenever i read it and i can't say much about it i wish i could read like the cover for you but i can't <laughs> but it is a definitely good book if you're looking for books about math and how it affects reality like statistics and machines and all that kind of stuff that goes into it and how biased math can be sometimes in social contexts this is a good book to pick up so definitely pick it up <laughs> Now, I have two books here that are a bit more queerified. And one of them is another book that I just read this year, and that is Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. I'm Ace, and I have had this book for a while, and I've been wanting to read it for a really long time. And I finally decided to read it this year and I loved it. Um, let me read a little bit inside because I f feel like I cannot talk about this book the way it deserves. Um, many people who hear about asexuality consider it an interesting piece of trivia. It's, little, it's a little known sexual orientation. Some people identify as asexual and they should be accepted. Next, after all, if you're not asexual, what more is there to learn? Let me read a little bit more than that. Plenty, especially because misconceptions mean that some people are asexual without knowing it. In every place that sexuality touches society, asexuality does too. And the issues that asexuals struggle with are the same issues that people of every orientation are likely to confront. This does a deep dive into asexuality. It gets gets into other people's experience with their asexuality and I just as an ace person I wish I could have had this book in my life a lot sooner I spent a lot of my time of my teen years chasing after people trying to find love um, despite being scared of it and not knowing why I really wanted it. I'm not opposed to being in a relationship. I don't think it's necessarily something that I'm incapable of. It's just that I've come to terms with the fact that I, there's parts of me that like don't want sex. I don't ever want to have sex with anyone. And I don't find anybody sexually attractive. I've never found anybody sexually attractive. I've had crushes on people, but I've never found anyone sexually attractive. And I, when I was in school, I kind of like pushed sex off to the side. I was like, well, I'm not gonna have it until I graduate high school. That's, that was my, Thing. I was like, I'm not going to do that until after I graduate high school. That's just what I'm going to do. And then it just kept being pushed back. And I'm like, do I even want to do this? Like, why, why did, do I even want to do this? Like, is this something I really want to do with my life? Is it really that important to me? And it's not. And it never was. And I wish I could have had this book sooner in my life. Because I would have understood myself a little bit better if I had. I feel like a lot of things would have aligned with my own self uh, a much, much sooner than it did when I was out of high school. I mean, I did learn about my sexuality um, a year or a couple of years, maybe three years out of high school, 
but at first I was just identifying as pansexual and then it wasn't until I started learning about asexuality that I was like wow that makes a lot of sense that's me you know and so I just wish I could have had this a lot sooner in my life and I think if you're looking to look into more niche sexualities this is definitely um one of those books that I think you should pick up because asexuality I wouldn't say is an uncommon sexuality but I don't like this book says I don't think a lot of people know a lot about it so definitely pick it up if you're looking for more queer stuff to read especially if we want to learn about asexuality if you don't know that much about asexuality this one is also a queer book but it also deals with a cult <laughs> and that is a queer and pleasant danger the true story of a nice Jewish boy who joins the Church of Scientology and leaves 12 years later to become the lovely lady she is today by Kate Bornstein. <laughs> this... Now, I did not read this entire book. Um, there was a chapter that I completely skipped and that was one where she talks about her sexual endeavors and i was like no she even like in the audiobook she's even like if you don't want to hear this skip this chapter and i'm like okay so i skipped that chapter but <laughs> but she does talk about her sex life a lot in this book and i don't think that's a bad thing but i just wanted to say if you're squeamish about reading about sex. I, I'm sure a lot of people on the book internet is, are not. I mean, a lot of people read romance novels that have very steamy scenes. <laughs> but if you are like me and are a bit um, unsure about sex and don't really want to read about it, don't worry. She gives you the option to st skip the entire chapter. I don't think it's important enough that you need to read it. <laughs> um, I I feel like if it was she probably would have said that um but it was just, it was a great story not story well it is kind of a story it is a memoir um and it is her journey through Scientology and her coming into herself as a trans woman and she has another book that I'm working on called uh forget what it's called but it's like what is it called I'll put a picture on the screen yeah you see it you see it right now uh, <laughs> but this book was great learning about her experience dealing with Scientology while also coming into herself as a queer woman um, was definitely an interesting experience especially because there are Scientologists tend to not agree for lack of lots of other bullshit <laughs> um, tend to not agree with queerness and while they try to deny those claims there are a lot of people in Scientology that still do not support queer people and so it was interesting to see where she comes from here and I'll just read a little bit <laughs> a, a little bit of the description and just to say before I read this there are some slurs in the description so just be forewarned Scientologist husband and father tranny sailor slave Playwright Dyke Gender Outlaw. That's the name of the other book, Gender Outlaw. <laughs> These are just a few words that have de de defined Kate Bornstein's story and Kate Bornstein during her extraordinary life. For her for the first time it all comes together in a queer and pleasant danger, Bornstein's stunning original memoir that's set to change lives and enrapture readers. Wickedly funny and disarmingly honest, this is Bernstein's most intimate book yet. 
With wisdom, wit, and an unwavering resolution to tell the truth, I must not tell lies, Bornstein shares her story. And I won't read the rest of this, but pretty much she was a part of Scientology, specifically the Sea Organization. And she ended up leaving Scientology once she started seeing the bullshit. Um, she definitely, yeah, it is, she does it in such a fun manner. You know, um, a lot of these cult books that I read are very heavy and there are definitely some heavy shit she puts in this book, but she does it in a, she does it in a funny manner, not in a, she, she makes, she brings a lightness to the book that I think wouldn't happen if she weren't a fun person herself that, you know, I just, she, she just had a fun story to tell and it obviously came from a lot of trauma and definitely take that into account when you read this book. But she does it in a fun way that it, you know, it's easy to parse. It's a bit easier to parse, you know? So if you're looking for talking about cults, this is probably a good place to start. Um, like I said, she does talk about her sexuality in this. And if you feel uncomfy about that, um, I'm sorry, but maybe that isn't the book for you. But <laughs> but if you're, if you're okay with that, um, this is a great book. This is a great book. And I absolutely adored it. <laughs> it was such it was such a fun book for what it is, for what it's about. It is a fun book. And I feel like it's a great book if you're looking to start getting into cultish type things. Um, because it's a bit more lighthearted about it. It def like I said, uh, it does deal with heavy stuff but she does it in a manner that makes it easier to parse, you know? And so this is a great book to start. And um, last one, and I'm already in 48 minutes here because I've been talking for a really long time. You can tell I love these books. But the last one also deals with Scientology and that is Troublemaker, Surviving Hollywood and Scientology. I'm not gonna say much about this book, but it's by Leah Ramini because I did a vlog about this book. In the vlog, I kind of ended it on a low note, not because I didn't like the book, but just because I had procrastinated making the last clip of the vlog that I didn't have much to say about it at that point, but I did enjoy this book. Now it is a memoir about her time in Scientology and it even has some pictures in here <laughs> if you want that. And I got this for Christmas, a little late of a Christmas gift, um, but I got it. It was from my roommate and I absolutely adored it. It was, it was definitely intense. She does kind of lighten up the mood by talking about her, um, her life in Hollywood as well. And she has a bit of a humor in her book. I highly recommend reading, if you do have the physical book, I highly recommend picking up the audiobook with it because obviously her voice is a great great way to experience the book like hearing it in her voice with her intonation and hearing all the jokes coming from her mouth just makes it better as an experience because i feel like if you're reading the book without the audiobook um it's not as fun <laughs> but um it's one of those books that kind of like kate bornstein's book um kind of takes humor in this awful situation and so I highly recommend this. Like I said, it wasn't my all-time favorite book, but I'm recommending it because if you're looking for culty stuff, this is a great place to stop. Start. If you are looking to start with cult stuff, I highly recommend starting with cultish. I'll put a picture on the screen. <laughs> I highly recommend starting with cultish and yeah, by Amanda Montel. And yeah, so 
Um, <laughs> this ended up just being a rave reviewing about the books that I absolutely loved reading. <laughs> I hope that you got something out of this, this and I hope that everything I said made sense. I think I've taken up enough of your time, so I'm gonna go. Have a great night, day, morning, wherever and whenever you're watching this and I'll see ya.